Hi, and welcome to another episode of the Leadership Enigma. Is it welcome to us or is it welcome back to us? I hope you're listening to us and maybe you're even watching us. And I hope you've started to watch us now on our brand new YouTube channel, because many of the episodes have become visual in relation to what the guests are showing us in the studio or perhaps even through their Zoom filters as well. So please, I don't want you to miss out on that. The podcast is going from strength to strength and I'm incredibly excited every time I talk to a new guest and I've been looking forward to this one because every now and again I come up with a guest who has got an extraordinary story and this is an extraordinary story. This is great evidence of how one person can be the change, how one person can create a movement, how one person can be an extraordinary force for good and indeed this story was turned into a documentary which won an Oscar and a number of other accolades as well so I hope I have your attention come back to me just after this break where we talk to the wonderful Oliver Perkovich in relation to Skatis Stan this story you need to hear come back to me just after this You're listening to The Leadership Enigma, powered by Transform Performance International, a podcast for the insatiably curious to explore the power of human-centered leadership to create real momentum for positive and sustainable change. Whether you're an entrepreneur, business owner, or corporate executive, each week we speak to global experts, academics, rising stars, ambitious upstarts, and disruptors as we discover that success leaves clues. Now, here's your host, Adam Pacifico. Hi, so it's a huge and warm welcome to Oliver, Oliver Perkovich. How are you, my friend? I'm doing really well. Great to be here. Uh, Very, very excited to speak to you again. Uh, A big shout out to our mutual friend, Mark Watt, for connecting us and suggesting that we have this conversation. And when we first chatted, my word, Oliver, do you have a story to tell? But before, before we allow the listeners and the viewers to actually start to understand that story, just give a little bit of a background about you. Who is Oliver? I'm, uh, I'm Australian. Uh, I, my mum's German. My dad was born in what's now Croatia. And uh, I grew up in different places. Uh, I had primary school in Papua New Guinea. Uh, I started skateboarding uh, at the age of five. So that's been something that's really, really important to me. And yeah, I guess I'm, uh, I'm, I'm very open to new opportunities. I've always been very adventurous and looking for new new things and new people to meet new things to experience that's me in a nutshell and i love that now we are going to start to zone in on the skateboarding piece as you say you started skateboarding at the age of five and that really is at the heart of this incredible story this is going to be a real privilege to to hear this story from you but let me just ask you a question what was it like to be so international at so early an age in relation to your your parents backgrounds and the fact that you you were living around the world what impact did that have I think it had a really big impact on me because I had all of these, I was lucky enough to have all of these different perspectives of uh, uh, grandparents in Germany, grandparents in in Australia, uh, the the really big international community in uh, Papua New Guinea. My best friend was a Chinese New Zealander. My other friend was Danish. Um, that that was that was pretty lucky as a as a kid growing up to just have all of those different um, just to be exposed to so many different cultures to be exposed to so many different ways of doing things, and yeah, that was a that was a big shock for me actually going back to Australia um, age ten right and. Uh, everybody being just very Australian. And I found it a little bit hard to to, to fit in. And I, I just try to be as Australian as possible at that, <laughs> that stage, I, which I'm, I don't know if it's a good thing or a bad thing. I'm trying to work out what that means. I'm trying to be as Australian as possible. You know, and that's not me trying to do an accent, by the way. But with, in other words, you've really been attracted to to living and working in a, in a melting pot. 
uh, and an incredibly diverse environment. And we talked about that that blend of cultures, which you've you've grown up with from a very early age. Let's start the story because I want to take you back to 2007, where I think that was the year that you went to Afghanistan, uh, because your your girlfriend had got a job there. Is that right? That's right. Um, I was uh, in Germany at the time, and my my girlfriend uh, Shana got a job in Kabul as a researcher. Right, and uh, I followed her there, and was also looking for a job. So that's what that's what brought me to Afghanistan. Well, you had a research background as well. I did, and so I was going. I was. I thought, well, if she can land a research job, I should be able to as as well. And. Yeah. Uh, but not having a job and being in Afghanistan was also a big advantage because any employers had a lot of restrictions. They try to keep their staff safe. And that meant that I had a lot more freedom than many other, many other foreigners on the, on the ground when I, when I first arrived in, in Kabul, I was, I was really at the, edge of my comfort zone it was it was something that was very new it was very unknown and uh i i just i I try to apply myself as best i could to that to that new new environment i was very interested in meeting up with uh I, you know, I applied for different I applied yep. for different jobs, uh, but I also got out and about um, on the on the streets of Kabul, and uh, that was that was pretty that was pretty exciting. That was I pretty bet. Exciting for me. Tell me, I mean, most people I think will not have been to Afghanistan. Uh, I've not been to Afghanistan, so tell us what were you what were you seeing and hearing? What was the atmosphere like on the streets of? Kabul when you were there in in 2007 what were you picking up on the it was it was a it was a period of uh, time when there were i mean a, a quite a large international presence yep. in in Kabul there was a lot of i mean what i i think what i was honing in on was there were all of these different actors uh, so to speak but nobody really really understood exactly what was going on there was the afghan government there was the international government there were the un agencies there were the the afghans themselves and everybody had their own little sphere of information and influence but the whole thing together was just a little bit unknown for 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 everybody so I think it was quite a, it was an environment that I felt comfortable in because I could also move from group to group. Okay. And I had a little bit of information from the kids that I was skateboarding on the street with, the ambassador that I had met at a at a party, the people that I lived with in a in a guest house that worked worked for the World Bank or for uh, for UN agencies. Um, I, uh, I I moved very very fluidly between these different groups, and uh, I, I saw that straight away I had a little bit of an advantage because other people weren't in touch with so many of these different uh, these different stakeholders. So gotcha. I guess it was it was a little bit of a not knowing. A lot of people felt like they didn't know what to do next. And there wasn't very much long-term planning. Uh, I would I would say over overall, from from what I could um, from what I could uh, perceive when I first arrived. Gotcha. And obviously, there are a number of skateboard decks behind your very head now that we're looking at. And I know that you took your skateboard uh, out to Afghanistan because obviously that's something that you had been involved in for many, many years. So tell me, how did how did that start, that you just, I think, started skateboarding on the streets of Kabul, as you have done with your skateboard in other cities? And what was the reaction when people first saw you skateboarding on the streets of Kabul? Yeah, I, I mean, I've been I've been a, a skateboarder since I was five. I'd travelled to lots of uh, lots of different countries before going to Afghanistan, and I'd always brought my skateboard with me. Yeah. So that was a that was that that was a given. 
And uh, I didn't really think that much more of it. it I arrived just sort of at the, the tail end of winter. So the, the streets were very, uh, very muddy and dirty and it wasn't really possible to, to, to skateboard in uh, right. February, March. Uh, 2007 but as soon as uh, spring and a little we had a little bit of better better weather um i pulled the pulled my skateboard out firstly just um skateboarding in the in the compound where i where where i lived and yep. then taking it out to um but we've uh, me and a couple of other uh people found some some spots to skate at a at a local high school um in the the central park in yep. in Kabul. And yeah, kids were just absolutely fascinated by the skateboard and big groups of people would form just sort of like, wow, what's, what's going on here. And, uh, that was, that was all just very, yeah, exciting and, and interesting that the, that the kids would wanted to interact with the, with, with the skateboard. And what was really interesting yeah. to me was the fact that girls wanted to try it out because girls didn't ride bicycles they you know in these same spaces there were boys playing basketball or um flying kites or doing uh, all of all activities that uh, would happen in a park yes and uh, girls weren't weren't doing these things because they were seen as activities just for boys and with with skateboarding being just a brand new activity it was it was somehow it was somewhat of a loophole and uh, I, I got really excited about it and, and started to then run more regular sessions, um, concentrating on uh, concentrating on girls. At a, at a certain point, we uh, found this really great place to um, to skateboard, which was an empty fountain, right? And uh, the empty fountain was a circular shape and sort of like a dish, like a um, like a bowl. Yeah, you would that you would eat out of, but uh, much much bigger. And what was what was great about this fountain was that um, I had control over my skateboard because when I was skateboarding in the park, quite often the kids would try to run off with the skateboard and <laughs> right. have to chase after them. So I'm the, assuming they're seeing a skateboard for the first time ever. Many of them. Yeah, I think for 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 a lot of a lot of the kids, they'd they definitely never seen a skateboard before. I'd asked some people, and they'd seen on Afghan television there right. was an advertisement for an Indian uh, soft drink, and they had skateboarders in it. So right. some people had had like, seen it on TV somewhere, but uh, that was the that was really the only. Um, but now you were the real thing. Yeah, that was the only context they had. So, and then I mean, jumping on a jumping on a skateboard for the first time is uh, something that was really exciting for these for these kids. And I I I was excited that they were excited because that was the feeling that I also had when I first skateboarded, and that same excitement that they had in their eyes. I, I yeah, I, sh I shared that and. So the 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 girls the girls wanting to skateboard was exciting to me, and I started to give the girls preferential um, treatment. I let the girls skateboard longer than the boys, uh, especially in this uh, where, where I was running uh, sessions in the in the fountain. I mean, did you have lots girls. of skateboards at this time, Oliver, or were just using what you had, had, what you and your friends had? I had, I think, I had around three skateboards right at the right at the start, yep. and we managed to then, as other people knew about the skateboarding program and were arriving then into Kabul, they were also bringing other more skateboards for us to for us to use. But um, yeah, it was it was uh, between between three and three and three and seven skateboards, I think. Okay, I mean, and essentially, you're running a social experiment at this point, aren't you? There's there's nothing more than just you've got whatever skateboards you can muster and kids are just joining in and you're allowing them to have a go in an empty fountain. Exactly. And what was, what was, what was, yeah, what was interesting was the, 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 the girls had more time to skate. Of course they got better than the boys right. because they had more, it was, uh, they had more opportunities. And then I ran competitions in different age groups and of course the girls beat the boys in all of the 
in all of the age groups because they had access to the to, to practicing more than the more than the boys. So that was that was the the experiment part of it. Right. And um, yeah, that was that you, you could see the girls were just so excited to be better than the boys when in a in a in a society where boys are giving given a lot more opportunities and of course then they get better at doing those things because they've got access to those uh those opportunities okay the the kids came from uh lots of different lots of different ethnic backgrounds and the the different ethnicities in in Afghanistan in Kabul um, didn't necessarily get along and uh, they were also divided by um, suburbs. So a certain suburb would be predominantly Hazara, another one would be predominantly Pashtun. And within the skateboarding session, the kids were all mixing across all of these different, um, across these different ethnicities, but also across different um, socioeconomic backgrounds. There were some kids that were definitely better off. There was one, one of the um, kids for Rose. His dad was a pilot um, for, for Safi Airlines, which was the Afghan airline. And other kids were basically had been uh, working on the streets since they were age five and were, were earning an income for their family as you know, for, a- for as long as they could, uh, for as long as they could remember. So that was that was another really exciting element for me, and huge real- inclusivity piece, isn't there, Oliver? Forgive me for interrupting. What we know, don't we, that sometimes sport is a massive, massive leveler, uh, in that all are welcome, regardless of of, of backgrounds, religious backgrounds, socioeconomic backgrounds, and so it sounds as if you started to see evidence of this inclusivity and also the power of pulling people together, the, the joy, the new experience that, that people were having. At what point did you realize that this was more than just you running a social experiment in a fountain with seven skateboards? At what point did you think, hang on, this is really powerful. There's something here. Uh, so at what point did you think, I've got to do more? The, the the there was a real turning point in those in those sessions at uh, at the Macaron Fountain, yep. where there was a a, a girl session um, one day, and uh, the, the 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 girls that came from all different backgrounds, uh, rich and poor, different ethnicities. After skateboarding, they they all held hands and uh, started to dance around in a circle in the in the fountain and and sing a song together, and that that's that's not what Amazing. normally happens after uh, <laughs> a skateboarding yeah. session. That's a, that's a very 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 out there, but it was such a it was a real eureka moment for me because there was. That that's kind of what my wish for Afghanistan was. These that was the wish that these kids had for mm. Afghanistan as well. They wanted to have a united country. They wanted to have opportunities between all of them. They wanted to connect, and it was actually happening. So, what my you know what what I really wanted, to, what the kids really wanted to see on a bigger scale was happening on a really small scale. And I thought, well, geez, if we could just work out how to scale this up, wouldn't that be totally amazing? There's something really, really special here because yeah. th- this I, I I don't see this happening in in other other places. There was a really good example from um, the. I can't remember exactly which which Olympics it it was. It must have been the the two thousand and eight Olympics. Right. Where there was an Afghan uh, bronze medal in the Taekwondo. Okay. What was very what was very significant about it was that the the person that won the medal Nick Pa was Hazara and Hazara are uh, basically the the lowest in the the pecking order of ethnicities in right. Afghanistan yet it was celebrated by the whole country they were all excited that an afghan 
had won uh, a, medal. a medal. And yeah. and so I, I saw this, I mean, so many people understand the power of sport to unite people and bring people together. That was really a, um, when, when he won that medal, people came out into the streets and, but they came from all different backgrounds and, and celebrated that. Amazing. And that that's normally, that, that didn't happen. There were many protests and many different times that people would come out onto the streets in Kabul, but it would be usually um, within a certain ethnicity. And, and this was, this was a change. So you saw I that did, unifying power. Didn't, didn't you? I, I want to give everyone a little bit of context because when we first spoke, I think you said to me that half the population of Afghanistan is under 15 years old. Is that correct? That's, that's right. And uh, 70% is uh, under the age of, of 25. So a very, very young, wow. young dem demographic. And also the demographic that really is interested in um, having somewhat of a different identity to that of their of their parents or their older brothers and sisters. Right. And because the kids that were, you know, these these girls that were dancing around the fountain were all part of this, the main part of the demographic. I thought, well, this is exactly who we need to. This is exactly the type of project that. Uh, that that Afghanistan needs right now. Yeah. These are voices that need to be amplified. How can these how can these kids have more more opportunities? What more is possible here? So this is what I want people to understand: is in two thousand and seven, you've gone to Afghanistan with your girlfriend as a researcher, saying, "I'm going to look for a job because your girlfriend has got a job." You've taken your skateboard there because you've been skateboarding since the age of five, and suddenly. In some ways, you've rolled across, no pun intended, you've rolled across this opportunity of, of being able to unite children from all walks of life with the power of skateboarding. And you've described this incredible scene in the fountain. Am I right in thinking that you actually started to really leverage this power and you, you started to link it to schooling? Is that right? Where you, you, you got skateboarding and schooling in some ways to be connected? And yeah, and I mean this this came this came also directly from the children them, themselves. Right. Um, the the wanting to wanting to skateboard. I didn't go to Afghanistan with the idea of starting a skateboarding project. I didn't go into the streets of Kabul with the idea of teaching kids to to skate. Um, I, I went out there to, to to skateboard, and they just really wanted to. That they really wanted to use my board instead of watch me skateboarding, <laughs> and so then this next uh, the next step was that the kids that were part of the the skateboarding program, they were they they came to me and said, "Hey, we don't we don't go to school, and we really want to go to school. Can you help us go to school?" and I, I kind of shrugged my shoulders at that point and thought, I've got no idea how to get you back to back to school. Yeah. I mean, if, if you've never been, but let's see what we can let's see what we can do. Um, I really wanted Afghans themselves, and especially this most important demographic, the kids under fifteen, to be leading what they actually wanted in the in the country and if they were then asking for education then this was exactly what we needed to follow follow up on and and try to try to deliver deliver on and so i thought that was a that was an opportunity to to help i needed i didn't have very much money at the time i was literally living on 15 20 dollars a week like right. really nothing but i could afford uh, a dollar a session for the for, for young girls to teach the other girls because that was quite important from a from a cultural um perspective okay and uh i did a one of one of the girls for zilla um she was going to school and then she uh her, she was uh, 12 years old and her parents pulled her out of school to basically beg full time and she, she, I saw her as having real potential as a skateboard instructor, and she was already a role model for the other girls. She came from this really poor background, but was a really good skateboarder. So I did a, I came into an agreement with her parents that if I'd pay her a dollar a session, 
she would they would allow her to go back to school so that was the first link to to education that we, that we had yeah. and so she came on and was doing these uh, skateboarding uh instruction for for the other girls and, and building out that uh, skateboarding in the street program but she was also then able to go to able to go to school and we we helped a couple of couple of other kids to to also uh, get back to school in this way but it also wasn't very scalable you know there was only a certain amount of uh, skateboard instructors that we needed and um, I didn't have very much money and but at least this link to education yeah. was made but and you're changing people's lives albeit one at a time Oliver but you, you're you're changing their lives it was it was a it was it was simply a, a a chance to listen to them for to to what they were what they were asking for and even with really really limited resources myself it was possible to make um make make some changes in these kids lives and that was that was exciting that was that was exactly where i wanted to wanted to be and it also made me think bigger again because the girls that were 12 years old they then they started to really get into problems with their parents or their older brothers and sisters taking part in right. sessions in a public space after the age of 12 boys and girls need to be separated in in afghanistan right and um for the girls to continue to skateboard age 13 age 14 age 15 they needed to be in a private space with no males at all right um and so that pushed me to think well how would that actually be possible and we just started to dream bigger and thought well what if we create an indoor uh, facility so that the girls can just keep on uh, keep on skateboarding because they were all so excited to do that and there was a group of around 25 girls and about 50 boys that were skateboarding at this stage wow. but because of the limited skateboards the limited space yeah. and in the time that I was giving the girls uh that was uh that that's that's kind of what the what the scale of it was and i managed to meet with the um the president of the olympic committee uh who just came in brand new uh, into that role uh zara akbar and he came to the the fountain and saw the sessions that, that i was running how did that come about oliver how, how how did it come about that he came to the fountain was that uh you'd arranged it or by chance that was uh, that was a little bit of a, a chance meeting between. Uh, I was playing. Uh, my mum being German, I spoke German. There were right. some Afghans that had uh, lived in Germany previously, yep. and I was playing football with them. And one of them had gone to high school together with the incoming president of the Olympic Committee. Right. They knew that I was like trying to make a connection to the Olympic Committee. Oh, that's this how life works. Who, <laughs> who they knew. And then I managed to have a meeting with right. him at the Olympic Committee. And then I invited him to, to, to see what was happening at the fountain. And he was blown away. I bet. And he said, right, I've got, I've got land let's uh let's let's build a let's build a skateboarding uh complex and uh that was then the point in time that i started to just go knocking on doors and see if i could get some support yep. to build uh, an indoor facility on the grounds of the, the afghan olympic uh, committee and you did it uh, piece piece by piece it came came together. The the uh, Canadian government were the the first people to uh, jump on. Right, and that was that was really just again a chance meeting. I was sitting in a cafe in in Kabul on a Skype call with with somebody, and I was really desperate it was like if i don't get five thousand dollars right now i can't keep on doing this uh, program that has started and is going on and uh, a journalist was sitting in the same uh, 
uh, the, the same cafe, overheard my Skype conversation, and then came up to me after my call and said, hey, I can uh, introduce you to the Canadian embassy. And so the Canadians came on board uh, with, with $15,000. Uh, then I managed to, to uh, snag a meeting with the, with the Norwegian uh, ambassador. Uh, he doubled that amount. Uh, we then, I, I managed through the Norwegian ambassador, uh, had a connection to both the, the, the Danish government and the, the German government, uh, governments in um, their embassies in, in Kabul. And we also brought them into the, into the project and uh, managed to then build the largest indoor sports and education facility for children in the country in 2009 on the grounds of the, the Olympic Committee with all of these different governments, uh, with the with a with a building company uh that was um uh gave us a really, really discounted rate for, for yeah. building that facility that it, it normally would have cost around $700,000 to build something uh, like that in Kabul at the time. And they offered it uh, to, to skate a stand for, for 200,000. And uh, I, the, the donors were all just absolute had their, had their minds blown what I was able to do with very limited funding um, and uh, a, a really good connection to the Afghan government yeah. in terms of working together with the Afghan Olympic Committee. And uh, we also had some other external global partners, Architecture for Humanity, uh, Nike Game Changers got, it, got involved. So I was able to put a larger pot of money together, use it really, really effectively and then open up this, this facility that then had uh, space for... Um, Incredible around 500 kids weekly. I only allowed as many boys to take part as we had girls enrolled in the program. Right. So from day one, again, we had in the, with, with the skate school, we had, um, we, we had 50% uh, girls, uh, girls participation. Uh, the kids from the fountain helped to build the ramps. We built them together with Andreas Schutzenberger, who was the basically the best ramp builder in the world, right. uh, came, came out to Afghanistan uh, and we just delivered something that just seems so um, incredible to so many people. And, and the opening of that, that facility in October 2009 was the best day of my life. Wow. Was... I mean, and we've got a picture, actually. I think uh, if James can pull up a picture maybe of, I think we've got some, some young girls on uh, a ramp there. Is this part and parcel of, of that indoor centre? Whether you can see it on the screens, it, it, it might well be. I don't know whether that's on the screen behind me or... I, uh, you can't see that yet. The yeah, the um, I I I I, I can't uh, can't see it. The 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 facility was uh, it's a case ban uh, case ban building that was um, I mean it, it had four classroom spaces. It had a large multi sport uh, court, so you could play basketball. We also built a climbing wall, and then behind it, uh, a large indoor um, uh, skate skate park. And we then were running uh, one hour of skateboarding with one hour in the classroom Incredible. and this was yeah. then, again the connection between um skateboarding, skateboarding and education <laughs> I, I mean th this is an unbelievable story it, it it's phenomenal which is why i really wanted to have this conversation with you so people can hear uh, and watch this uh, and in some ways be in awe an amazing example of having no resources but an enormous amount of resourcefulness you know you've gone from as you say may be able to share a one dollar with getting just one girl uh, uh, able to help you and then this has exploded and you've managed to get resources and buy-in and people have seen your efforts and and again what an amazing example of one person being a change uh, and skatistan was was born and tell us wh where is it now you know 2023 uh, what is the organization now what's it doing what's its size tell us kind of modern day story 
Uh, right now, um, we we have uh, projects. Uh, we've, we've got twelve projects around the around the world. Yep. Uh, we've got the, the skate schools, three skate schools in Afghanistan that continue to to operate. We've got a skate school in uh, Johannesburg, South Africa, and also in Phnom Penh in Cambodia. Right. And then we've got uh, partner projects in a number of other other countries: Kenya, Bolivia, Albania, uh, Sweden, um, uh, Jordan, <laughs> Iraq, Lebanon. There's 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 quite a lot of uh, a lot of projects, and we've also got then a knowledge sharing network called the Good Push Alliance. And since Skaterstan started, it has inspired a lot of other social skateboard projects to pop up all around the world. They saw what we were doing. They were, they were really excited what they saw, especially in terms of that inclusion piece, being able to include uh, children living with disabilities, uh, girls in the programming, um, really being these safe spaces and, and hubs for uh, creating amazing, amazing little communities. And we're now connected with over 850 social skate projects in over 100 countries. And uh, we share knowledge with, with them. We've got a, um, we, we run webinars, we've got an e-learning platform, and all of those resources are available free to, to all of these uh, all of these organizations. We don't see them as competitors at all. They're all part of our ecosystem. They're all part of our social scape world. And uh, we want to we want to see them succeed. And we've made so many mistakes over the last fifteen years, <laughs> and we don't want them to <laughs> learn. Learning as you go. I think it's called fixing as you fly, isn't it? And I want people to understand this is an incredibly inspiring and humbling story where a social experiment on the streets of Kabul with literally nothing, maybe six or seven skateboards, has now turned into an incredible movement across the world now, Oliver. And and it's also turned into a, a documentary. I think it was uh, Learning to Skateboard in a War Zone, and in brackets, If You're a Girl. Have I got the title right? You, you have. <laughs> right. That, uh, that, Tell uh, us about that, because there's even more accolades associated to this story. But you, you tell that part. It's uh, yeah, that was a that was a really exciting uh, film project that we that we took on with A uh, and E um, from from the US, yep. and it, it it's a story that follows uh, a group of uh, girls in Kabul that go through our back to school program, and so in the back to school program, the girls go through three grades of regular school yep. in one year with us. And then we help them to enter into the regular school system. So the actual idea behind that um, program was initiated by Fazilla asking me right at the start, like, I yeah. really want to go back to school. How do I, how do, I do it? Um, us opening the facility and running these skate and create crash sessions yeah. and then some of the kids saying, hey, I want to go to regular school as well. How do I do it? And, and the film uh, shows beautifully uh, these, these kids learning to skateboard, uh, these girls learning in the in in the classroom, coming from all different uh, uh, yeah, coming from all all different all different backgrounds, and the the film uh, initially was uh, released at Tribeca. It won there. It uh, was entered into the BAFTA awards and uh, won a BAFTA, and uh, ultimately also was was nominated for an Academy Award and, and won an Oscar uh, all in all in 2020. So that was uh, quite the experience to be at the Oscars. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I, I I went there with uh, with with Tony Hawk and uh, with uh, wow. a number of people from from A and E, uh, and it was uh, it was it was really really so yeah so exciting to to see something that just started from 
just kind of a little bit of a crazy idea of listening yeah. to the listening to the kids to um really literally being on the world world stage and 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 winning so it was in the category of short documentary so it's 40 minutes long and right. uh, yeah i encourage you to search it out and uh try to um uh, yeah and and watch the watch the documentary what? James is hunting through, <laughs> hunting through video now. I can see on there. I mean, this is just an incredible story, as you say, from the streets of Kabul. You, no money, <clears throat> a skateboard, and now you're talking about winning multiple awards for the documentary, including an Oscar. But more importantly, you've created a movement all over the world that is serving so many children in relation to uniting them giving them access to education. I think it's one of the most extraordinary stories that I've had on the podcast so so far. Uh, and I'm grateful to Mark for putting us in touch. And I'm really grateful for you taking the time to tell this particular story. Oliver, let me ask you this. What have you learned from this incredible journey? I've learned a lot of a lot of things. I, I think what was what was really really important was always being on the threshold of what was of, of my comfort zone. Right, pushing I was yourself. Never comfortable. Right. I was never comfortable. I was. It was just one situation after another where I was just hanging in there. And uh, and I'm and I'm sure that uh, um, Mark Watt will also remember uh, the the multiple times that that we chatted together, and uh, I, I was just only just holding it together. I mean, the whole the whole ride, and 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 that's that's a really important place to be to be able to be open, to be able to yeah. be in the moment and to be able to learn. If you're not really, if, if you're in your comfort zone, you're not you know, learning you know, you, that these, these things aren't, aren't going to happen. And it was, it was step by step. I mean, the first, the first one for me was literally even just doing, uh, just doing media. Some, uh, I think there were BBC and the guardian and a couple of other, there's, there's all of those, uh, news, news networks, yeah. uh, CNN also were all in Kabul and they heard about the, you know the, the Australian guy with the, the the skateboarders in a in a fountain, and they they came knocking, and I didn't know I didn't know what to say to to a journalist about what I was doing, but I learned really fast, and uh, that was the that was the first time where I was like, okay, this is an opportunity. I've got to I've got to grab it. I've got to yeah. take this. Um, this doesn't feel comfortable. I don't want to speak to a camera and 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 think about exactly the right things to say but i've got to just do it right now and and then i wasn't comfortable with asking for money and uh trying to get to trying to get but i had to i had to do it and once i did it I did that. I did that next step. I didn't feel comfortable trying to establish yeah. a um a non-profit on the on the streets of Kabul, but I was like, well, I just need to reach out and get get support. It's like there is somebody somewhere that has set up a non-profit here before. How do I find this person? How can I how can I get yeah. in contact with them? And how can they help me actually do this next uh, next next step? So I was I was always putting myself out there, but I was always uncomfortable. It was, it was, it was never this, it was, it was never, it was never easy, but I I, it was an exciting place to, it was an exciting place to be as soon as you saw things working, yeah. as soon as I saw Momentum. kids coming to the, coming to the sessions, as soon as then the Olympic committee president gave me a piece of land, as soon as these multilateral organizations all of a sudden started to give us, I mean, quite large sums of money. I was like, well, I don't want to let these people down. People mm. believe in, uh, believe in the project. They believe in the kids. They, they, they want to back it. Like, how do I, how do I now deliver on this next level? You've got a. I mean, my background, my my 
<laughs> my degrees in chemistry. So. <laughs> it's called diversification there, Oliver, that's for sure. You know what? It always takes a lone maverick sometimes to be that catalyst for change and being comfortable in being uncomfortable. I mean, so many uh, wonderful, I think, leadership lessons out of this story, which is why I wanted you to tell it. How do people get in touch, Oliver, and, and join in the conversation, help you in some ways? In, in, I know you're still looking for funding and opportunity. Who knows? But how do people get in touch and, and learn more? Uh, Skaterstan has a website, so skaterstan.org. Yep. Um, we've also been very, very active on social media right from the start. So uh, Instagram and Twitter and, and Facebook are, are really uh, important platforms. Okay. LinkedIn, uh, we, we have updates all the time. So find the at Skaterstan and uh uh join in and uh, get um, get involved you can get uh, get all of the all of the updates there uh we we run multiple uh fundraisers every every year and uh we're, we're currently looking for some uh larger collaborations so we're really interested to to work with companies that uh could imagine backing us for five years and uh we're we're, we're really the, the next step is this uh global uh, global expansion right. and utilizing those 850 plus social scape projects uh, all over the world that um, need uh, want to grow uh, have all of the knowledge from us in terms of how to do it really well and uh, we want to we want to try to get as many resources right there to the ground where it really makes a really makes a big a big difference these are local projects run by locals with uh, very very uh, very grassroots projects so a lot a lot of the time that have huge impacts in their okay. in their community so yeah people uh, definitely social media is and and the platforms that you regularly use are a, a great way to uh, stay in um, stay in touch with 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 us and, right. and find out more okay well i hope this episode uh, does its part in getting this story out uh, and i certainly am uh, incredibly humbled and inspired by the story oliver i just want to say a huge thank you for taking the time to come on to the leadership enigma my absolute pleasure thank you so much for having me take great care join us again next week for more tips and strategies on the leadership enigma we'd love to hear your comments on today's show as well as suggestions for future topics and guests get in touch with your host on linkedin or visit the dedicated website www.leadersenigma.com powered by transform performance international where you can access our exclusive learning including books videos, bonus content, assessments, and more. Please don't forget to rate, review, and subscribe on all your major podcast platforms. Thanks for listening.